I come to you today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So during Memorial Day weekend, one of the customs is to preach about the sacrifice that has been given by so many brave men and women throughout our history to guarantee the freedoms that we now enjoy. But it occurs to me in every single uh, sermon I've heard for Memorial Day, or even Veterans Day, there's one group that I don't think gets enough love. And somebody here in the front row is really going to be happy today, because it's the Coasties, right? The Coast Guard. And the reason that I just found it so relevant today is because in the Coast Guard, there are a special group of people who, for some reason, decide to jump out of perfectly good helicopters into the water to go save people who their boat has, you know, become disabled or they're drowning or something. And these are the people whose motto is that others may live. That's like a really good Christian motto, like something Jesus might say. And the reason that it fascinated me so much, because I started to do some research into how they train these divers, and you don't have to just be a good swimmer. You can be a good swimmer. You have to make quick decisions that determine who's going to live and who's going to die. And so what will happen is a diver may come across somebody who is freaking out so much because they're drowning and who wouldn't, that they no longer become a threat just to themselves, but to the diver. And so the diver has to learn how to subdue that person and get them under control in order to save their life. And while it's not in any official document, if you read the stories from some of these divers, they say that there has been an occasion where they've had to pop somebody a little bit to calm them down or almost knock them out just to get them under control. And uh, the thought that I had when it came to that was, I'm so glad that wasn't a course in seminary. Because <laughs> that's not, a, ma- that's not a, a, a model of pastoral care that I want to be able to exercise. But it just goes to show that trying to save somebody can be very difficult if in that moment they either don't know how to be saved or maybe they don't want to be saved. In today's gospel, Jesus comes to this beautiful place inside the city of Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate, and I've actually been there, which is why I was so excited about this text, is you walk in and you do see the porticos and you do see the area where the water was, and this is a place where the people who were invalids and people who had been crippled or lame laid there. And one of the reasons they did is that in the pool of water they believed that an angel would come and stir up the water. And if you got there in time, if you were the first one to get in the water, you would be healed. So just think about that for a moment. There's one opportunity, it doesn't happen all the time, and everybody's in competition with one another. Does it sound like people are going to help one another? Probably not. And so Jesus, they point out this man who's been sick for 38 years. Which makes us think for a moment about the people who suffer from chronic conditions all their life, who sometimes we forget in our prayer and we forget in our love of the parish that there are some people who every single day is pain. And he sees this man, he knows he's been sick for 38 years, and he asks him what I have always found to be, Lord Jesus forgive me, a silly question. Do you want to be healed? Now, you or I might say something like, duh. (laughs) Yes, I do want to be healed. But keep in mind, this man has been sick for 38 years, and all he has seen is people step over him because he can't get down there. So instead of saying yes, he's given up hope. There's no hope in his heart. He tells Jesus the reason why it's not going to happen. He also doesn't really know who Jesus is, and that doesn't help either. He tells them, I'd love to, sir, but when they stir the, when the angel stirs the water, I can't get there in time. Nobody will take me. Instead of accepting the possibility of grace, he states the problem. That sounds familiar. 
We can do that. And Jesus' command to this man who's been sick for 38 years is just get up and walk. Because Jesus' word and his command rules all of nature, rules all of the body, all of the mind, and all of the heart and soul. To the point that if he says it, it'll happen. But the man had to actually decide to get up. Jesus can say, get up and walk, but if the guy says, well, I don't really think I can, no, he just, in that moment, gave in and did it. So it makes me think for a moment, what are the reasons that people say no to grace? What are the reasons that people say no to healing? Because at some level, we all do at one point. We don't always accept God's grace. And I think it happens for a couple of reasons. The first one is we are afraid that it can't reach us. We're afraid that we are the one soul in all of history and all the souls that will be created that God's grace just can't penetrate us. And the image that I give is, you know, we're getting ready for hurricane season now and everybody's got those big shutters and windows and everything that they put on. And those are very useful and very proper that you do that because you don't want, like on our church here, you put the shutters up so the wind doesn't come right through and destroy everything. But those shutters aren't meant to be used every day. If all you do is keep your windows closed, you don't let in any light. And just like plants need sunlight, we need God's grace to live. God's grace is his favor and goodness and love towards us that he gives without any expectation of anything in return just because he loves us, like a good parent would. And so when we keep those windows closed and we say, no, they can't come in. And sometimes we say that God can't reach us because of something that we've done. Like maybe we believe there's a sin that he can't forgive or a wound that he can't heal, or a relationship that he can't reconcile. And God says, just open the windows and let me in. The other reason is because we're too independently minded. We're too stubborn. We'll say, I don't need God's grace. I've been getting along fine in my life without God's grace up until now, and everything has been fine for me. Well, the first thing I would say is, well, God's grace has probably been manifesting in our lives a lot that we didn't even realize. But the second thing, if we've been getting up to here without God's grace, imagine where we would go with it. And so sometimes we have to admit that we can't handle something on our own and say, Lord, I need your help. It's kind of like when I'm in that kitchen trying to undo that jar. And I know that I've loosened it up just a little bit because I can loosen it. But then I know the only other person in the house who's going to open that thing is my wife. <laughs> and I go, okay, do I really want to ask for help? Because I know what she'll do. She'll come over and I'll say, I loosened it for you. <laughs> But we have to allow people and God to help us. But see, intertwined within those two reasons, I think, is the deeper reason why we don't always accept God's grace. And it's fear. It's fear that it might actually work. It might just be me. Either I'm getting older or there's more medications that they're marketing on television at night. Or maybe both. But do you notice that when you're watching TV and it says, do you have itchy, watery eyes? And I go, well, it is Florida, you know, pollen season. And it says, well, take such and such medication, but be aware of the side effects. The side effects include bleeding from the eyes, you know, loss of hearing, you know, kidney failure and sudden death. You know what? I'm going to stick with the watery eyes. But think about it. Grace has side effects. Once we allow God's grace to come into our hearts, there's all kinds of unintended consequences that can happen. So, for example, exposure to God's grace may have the following effects in our lives. Joy. 
we might experience true and complete joy because of God's grace. We might experience peace from old wounds, peace from old broken relationships. We might experience the gifts of the Holy Spirit that cause us to care and love for others. Grace just might transform our lives in ways that we can't even imagine. But we have to choose if we're going to be like those poor swimmers who are thrashing about and afraid. Are we going to be like that or are we going to be like those who accept the hand that's being given out to them? We have to decide that. You know, during the Easter season, it's all about living the resurrected life. That's kind of what our theme has, has been. And one of the things that I want to remind us is that the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead is the same spirit that's within each one of us. And so if, he, if God can pull that off, I'm pretty sure he can handle anything that I might bring to him. On Easter Sunday, when we had all our visitors here and longtime members, we had a nice full house, I mentioned that the resurrected life begins with actually walking out of the tomb. If we don't walk out, then we're just basically saying to ourselves, we want to stay dead, we want to stay in the tomb. Well, let's take that one step further back. Before God raised Jesus from the dead, he had to move the stone. What's the use of living a resurrected life, of being raised from the dead, if you can't get out of the tomb? And so, what rock does Jesus need to move in our life, in my life? Is it a relationship that I'm having difficulty with? Is it a disease from which I'm suffering? Is it a depression that I can't get over? Is it fear that I might actually enjoy being loved by God. All those are the rocks we put in front of that tomb. And so that is my challenge and question for us today. Do we want to allow God to move that stone so that we can walk out and live that resurrected life? Thank you for saying